Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Welcome again to the big picture. Today, our Army cameras will be trained into several corners of the globe to bring you a pictorial report of on-the-spot Army news. Our first report is on the Army's development of television for use on the battlefield. TV history in the making. The Army's first mobile television unit arrives at West Point to cover the Military Academy's summer maneuvers. Special equipment, transmitter, receivers, power bands roll onto the field to provide an on-the-spot record of the mock warfare as it unfolds. In the command post a few miles away, the staff will be able to study the battle as it develops on a TV screen. These Signal Corps men are assigned the important task of discovering TV's role in modern warfare. To accomplish their job, they are provided with the finest equipment. They are highly trained technicians in video transmission. At a sand table mock-up, three TV cameras go into action. While on the field classroom, 180 cadets receive instructions. In the central video control room, three live pictures are produced on monitor screens. Technicians select the picture best suited for transmission to the audience at their receiver sets. In this way, the lessons of the infantry artillery team are presented not just to one cadet class, but to many simultaneously. Lecture and training aids are coordinated by the TV camera. The cadets use the Bishop training aid, a device used to simulate battery fire. This one class demonstration may be seen by hundreds on their TV sets miles away. The cameraman focuses his lens to cover the action. Fire! Demonstrations like this are proving the enormous value of TV as a military training aid. The TV camera now prepares for its role in military tactics. Signal Corps commentators at Lake Popolopan watch the monitoring set and give an account of the action for the official observers. Miles away, the Academy's staff will prepare critiques based on what they see on their receivers. The combat-equipped company of cadets prepare for a simulated assault on an enemy beachhead 200 yards away. The action is presented to the audience as it happens. Combined audio and video is fed to TV film recording equipment to any point up to 20 miles away. A TV close-up covers the boat launching and closely follows the progress of the water crossing. A television camera is airborne to transmit an aerial view. In wartime operations, this type of visual information could prove invaluable to an audience of staff officers, giving them an immediate picture of the battle situation. Intelligence, reconnaissance, fire control, briefings, the military potentialities of television are unlimited. The experiments conducted by the Signal Corps mobile TV section prove successful. An enthusiastic audience sees the beginnings of a new future for military television. 
Every day the army grows stronger as mechanical improvements are made to weapons and equipment. But in the final analysis, it is still the foot soldier who must win and hold the battlefield. To make sure our combat soldier is tough enough to carry out this mission, whatever the battlefield terrain, the Army has this kind of finishing school for infantrymen. Join the Army and stay on the ground, said the recruiting sergeant. So what happened? I'm making like a mountain goat 12,000 feet up in the air already. Mountain warfare training, they call it. You gotta be able to fight and know your way around, however high the mountain. And to learn the ropes, they got a school for it in Austria. One morning, they put some packs on our backs and marched us to the mountains, just like that. You're gonna be mountaineers, they said. It was the kind of day infantrymen just loved. Rain poured down steadily as we gathered round the instructors. And a steady trickle of water running down the back of your neck felt good when stopped. Before you can learn how to climb mountains, you gotta be able to walk on them, said the instructor. Of course, he forgot to tell you he was gonna tilt the floor to a crazy angle. You ever tried walking on an uphill grade covered with ball bearings? So hours later, you finally get to the top. And when you do, what does the man say? All right, you guys, now run down to the bottom. And down you come. Now that you've mastered mountain walking, you must learn a few hand and footholds, which will help you turn into a human fly. This is known as your buddy's dirty boot hole. When possible, it should be used during rainy weather. Otherwise, you don't get as dirty. You're on your own now, boy. Using hand and feet and sometimes your knees, you just got to climb that rock face. You know the handholds. Just do like the man said. What's that, boy? Nothing to hold on to. Great old white hat would just love that. You're learning fast, boy. See, I knew you'd make it. Yep, this is the top. What do you do now? My boy, you're new, ain't you? You climb down again, boy. Then the complicated stuff begins. Your hands and feet will take you just so far. Now you must learn about rope climbing. What knots to use and what knots not to use. The climbs get tougher, but so do you. And there's a terrific thrill in conquering nature's greatest obstacles. It's a science. A science where a slip of an inch can be as good as a mile, straight down. There are all kinds of ways of beating this old mountain, and you'll learn them all. Up or down, you know how to do it now. You've lost a few fingernails, but your hands are like hooks. And instead of legs, you've got a couple of clamps on two long springs. You're becoming a mountaineer, and you respect the danger. This business isn't funny anymore. A guy might be injured up there on the mountain. And there's ways of getting them down if you listen. And you listen. Because one day that guy on the mountain might be you. There are many ways of evacuating the wounded from a mountain. You have to learn the right way. How to lash a man to a stretcher and keep him there is all part of the training. He's got to be tied down tight, for his journey to safety can be rough and dangerous.
whether it's Indian fashion or aerial tramway. It's the final stage of the course now. You've learned how to climb up the impossible. Now you must learn how to make a rope bridge so you can climb from one impossible to the other. And once you've made it, you've got to know how to get across it. It's easy. They show you how it's done. And then it's your turn. One step forward, and you push out with your arms. It's easy once you know how. By graduation day, all the hours of practice have paid off. And a dangerous uphill rope bridge over a deep ravine is the final test of your skill and training. Whatever the terrain or obstacle, we're ready. There ain't a mountain in the world that can scare us. A little known role in the Army's many activities, but one of the most important on the battlefield is that of the Army pilots, the soldiers who fly the Army's planes. We take you now to an airfield in Korea, where a mission is about to begin. It's quiet on the strip now. The planes stand idle in and out of the hangars, frozen by the uneasy troops. But not so long ago, they worked around the clock here in Korea, sending army planes deep over the enemy's lines to reconnoiter and report. It would begin like this. The operations officer got the first word. By phone, he learned that a troop commander at the front was running into trouble from a concealed enemy gun. Its position was concealed from ground observation by the mountains. It was up to Army air observers to do the job. Assigned to the task were an Army pilot, an observer, and a small Army plane. From the ready room came the pilot and observer, veterans of many such missions. First, it's to the operations center to get briefed. Trying to find that gun can be like looking for a needle in a haystack. So get all the information you can before takeoff. Whether you find it or not might mean the difference of a lot of lives saved or lost. It can be hot up there too while it lasts, so slip on a flak vest. Your life has been saved twice by it already. You don't need convincing. And this is Bertha, your plane. She's slow and she's never owned a gun in her life, but she's got a tough skin and she's been going steady with you for a long time now. Before every mission, the plane must be checked over completely with the mechanic who keeps her in trim. She's been shot at and peppered with small arms fire but she's never failed to bring you home yet. A last minute check with the tower and the mission begins. high until you get over the enemy's lines, but all the way you keep your eyes peeled for trouble. And now approaching battle zone. Black is light, 
I'm going down for a look-see. Over. Target spotted, 0152 at Mike 773. A closer look to confirm the position, and then up and home as quick as you can. This time it was easy, but all the facts of the mission must go into the record just the same. How many guns did you see? What was their position? Were there any obvious troop movements? It must all go into the report. Day and night during the Korean campaign, our army pilots and observers flew their missions over enemy territory, their only protection of 45 strapped to their leg and an abiding faith in their own flying skill. Helping them to write this new page of army aviation history were the mechanics and technicians who kept the flying Berthas flying fit. Theirs was not such a glamorous role, but it was every bit as important. They were part of the great army team which fought so well in Korea without ever firing a shot. Today, the crewmen and planes of army aviation stand ready still, awaiting the outcome of peace. Small planes, unarmed and slow, but doing a big job. A man-sized job. man size. That's an expression you hear a lot in the army. We'll make a man of you, says the sergeant to the trainee. Any ex-army man will know that this is what he meant. At Camp Gordon, Georgia, an arena called a struggle pit gives Sigal Corps basics a taste of man-to-man -man combat. A painless first step in eliminating any timidity among trainees. That is, men. Today we're going to give you a chance to have some fun in the struggle pits. First off, we're going to show you some things that you may not do in the pit. Demonstrator, come forward. First off, remember, you cannot use your fingers to guide the man's eye. You cannot pull or twist his nose. You cannot Grab his lip to pull him, to push him, or twist him. You may not use body slams with your fist. Any part of the body. You cannot grab the man's ears. Remember, you may not use any jujitsu. You also may not use any judo. <coughs> also, you may not use your knee to the groin. You may not run your feet down the man's shins or use his instep to hold him. The only thing, the only way you may get the man out of the pit is by bodily picking him up, carrying him to the wall, and throwing him. Now we'll run over our procedure that we follow here in the pits using a whistle. On the first whistle, you'll get on your feet, move under the ropes, line up on the outside of the pits. On the second whistle, you'll charge into the pits and engage each other. On the third whistle... In other words, Junior, it's doing. murder by the numbers. On the fourth whistle, you'll clear the pits by your respective side. Now, if anyone is injured, remember, call a referee or myself. We'll blow the whistle, everybody stops, and we get him out of there. Are there any questions?
Is there a doctor in the house? It's gonna be a lovely day for a hanging. Wait, them swear dogs. <laughs> Gee, you don't have to get sore. I can take a hint. quietly. And so, Junior loses fear and timidity, and what's left emerges as a man. A lighter side to army training, but one which has its kicks. For our last report, we go to Germany, where our on-the-spot cameras record the military police on duty in this powder keg country. Of all the American troops stationed in Europe, it is the military police in Germany who come closer than anybody to the tensions of this strategic area. The MP on town patrol must work closely with civilian authorities in preventing any kind of trouble which might flare up between East and West. American military police and the German civil police jointly patrol the town, and a normal day's duty will see the MP checking his beat with a German policeman and his police dog. At the lonely border stations where a wooden barrier across the street is the difference between democracy and communism, the MP again works in unison with the German police. It is at spots like this that the tension is at its highest and the military police patrols must constantly be on the alert. A special MP highway patrol polices the Autobahns and is part of the huge security network which protects the western zone. Any suspect car believed carrying contraband goods from the U.S. zone can be halted and searched at any of the border crossings. A German customs official carries out the actual search under the watchful eyes of the MP customs unit. Freight trains entering the east zone are checked by the MP customs unit. Men trained to look for strategic materials and phony documents search the manifest to make sure the consignment is in order. By the end of his very full day, the MP in Germany is ready for bed. But he doesn't always get a good night's sleep. Sometimes, this happens. <whistles> alert! Alert! Even MPs living off post are called back in. Everybody turns out with full field combat equipment. They might be gone for days. If they are wanted, the MPs are ready to turn out for any emergency at a second's notice. The MPs also ride the Berlin Express as one of their many duties. 
At the station in Frankfurt, they stand guard while passengers board the train. The express passes through the Russian zone on its way to Berlin, and maximum security precautions are taken. The passengers are a mixed lot of all nationalities. Their papers must be checked and rechecked, and each passenger must carry a copy of their traveling orders in Russian. It takes a lot of paperwork and permits to travel on this train. Once on board, the passengers must stay there until Berlin is reached in the morning. The tensions of a journey on this express are reflected in the face of the German train guard. The last passenger is put aboard and the MPs follow him. Every door of the train is locked and is kept locked for the entire journey. Patrolling the train, the MPs protect the U.S. personnel and mail, which nightly ride the Berlin Express. Every day, the military police in Germany stand inspection before going out on duty. Standards are high, but these men are veterans, carefully trained for their difficult job. As long as our troops remain in Germany, the military police will be there, guardians and protectors of our army, as well as soldier ambassadors of America. Next week, the Army will bring you another pictorial report on your Army at home and overseas. Now, this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us then. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.